Hey friends, happy Labor Day. Uh, I'm in the Verslet shop sending you video number three for the Life Group study. Uh, video number one had the context for 1 John. Video number two had 1 John chapter one. We just kind of went through, stopped and started along the way. Uh, and then this video is 1 John chapter two and it's 29 verses. Uh, chapter one was 10 verses. So why don't we just get into it? We'll stop and start along the way, all right? Uh, verse one, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Romans chapter 3 is a great resource for this too. I'm just going to give you some cross-references throughout our time in this video. Uh, Romans chapter 3, at the, at the end of this, uh, verse 2, he says he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, so remember that Gnostic belief of elitism, right? That there's a hierarchy of individuals. What he's saying here is this is for all. And Paul in Romans chapter 3, he says, uh, God is the God of the Gentiles and the Jews alike, both. And so there's no more elitism. There's no more hierarchy. God is the God of all humankind. And so uh, that's a big deal he's speaking into right there. He also, at the end of chapter 1, he was talking about that uh, for those who claim to have no sin, uh, they're a liar. The truth is not in them. Uh, and so here he's saying, just because you do have sin doesn't mean you should go on willfully sinning. The idea being that that when we have new life in Christ, we, we want to, that Colossians 3 mentality, we want to slowly trade the old life for the new life. And so we don't want to willfully continue to sin. And yet, he also says that when we do sin, there is an atoning sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And that word atone means to, to essentially pay down the debt owed. And that's good language because uh, the idea being that there was a debt owed. It's not that we no longer owe a debt. It's that he paid the debt. It's not that we weren't uh, guilty. It's that he paid down, he paid the punishment for that guilt. And so we got to recognize that reality. All right, let's keep reading. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. All right, so remember the Gnostic belief that it's all about what you know. <clears throat> John is speaking into that directly here. And you got to remember, he spent all this time with Jesus, and Jesus was speaking into the heart. I mean, how often, and we're talking about this in our Unseen Kingdom series, but how often was he talking into the heart? I mean, directly into the heart, right? And so you had the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, who really thought it was all about what you did, the outward. And here you have a Gnostic belief thinking it's all about what you know in your mind, but they're still not addressing the heart. Jesus wants our entire being to treasure after him. He wants our heart to let everything that's deep within us just flow out of us into the things that we do, into the things that we choose for our mind to be set on. And so in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And just as we read in the, the first week of the unseen kingdom, Matthew chapter 12, or you can find it in Luke chapter 6, he says, it is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Thus, if your actions continue to refuse to keep his commands, then you cannot say that that's where your heart is set on. So the idea that John is speaking into here is the Gnostic belief of knowledge is all you need, and it doesn't matter if it ever leaks into affecting your actions and the pharisaical belief of it's just about your actions. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's, it's about the control center of the self. It's about your inner being that you, you just treasure. You, you're motivated by the things that, that Jesus loves and the ways of Jesus, right? And then out of that, the things that we think about, the things that we're motivated by, the things that are outward, start to come out, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's where we want to get to as Christians. And that's what John is speaking into here. All right, verse seven. Uh, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing 
and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Okay, so let's talk about the old command and the new command. All right, the old command uh, that we're still run by today, by the way, it's not old like it's over. It's, it's old as in it's been there since the beginning, but it's, it continues to run our lives today. Uh, can be found in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, the expert in the law comes to test Jesus and asks, what's the greatest command in the law? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All right, so these two commandments can be found even before the time of the Gospels. All right, you can go uh, to Deuteronomy 6 about the loving God passage. You can go to Levit Leviticus 19, love your neighbor passage. Uh, but Jesus says, if you've got these two commands, you've got the entire law and the prophets. Everything is summed up in these two. But then what's the new command? Well, remember, John spent a lot of time with Jesus. In fact, if you go to the Gospel of John, you go to uh, chapter 13, this is a new command from Jesus himself, all right? He's just gotten done washing the feet of all the disciples, including Judas, who was about to betray him. Uh, he And it talks about how his hour had come, and yet he continued to love them to the end, all right? And so after after all those things, and he's, he's about to be taken into custody, uh, he gives this command. He says, uh, a new command I give you, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, so that's the new command that John's referring to. And we know that because he goes on to talk about loving brothers and sisters. And if you do not love them, you're walking in darkness. Why? Because if you're not going where Jesus is going, if you're not following his example, and he is the light, the light of the world, then by definition, not following him and his example means that we're walking in darkness. So we've got to love our brothers and sisters the way he did, which means, by the way, when people spit in our face, uh, when people treat us poorly, uh, that doesn't dictate the fact that we continue to love as Jesus loved. All right, so let's go on to verse 12. This is a fun section here. Um, nobody really knows <laughs> what John is saying here. Uh, but here's a few things that I've gathered that I think we can kind of infer from this section. All right, verse 12, he says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Okay, so why does he say it like that? Uh, perhaps he's talking about the uh, very elementary, basic, but crucial understanding of the gospel. This is kind of entry-level stuff. And yet, at the same time, uh, it, to grasp that idea really is a lifelong process as well. It's an incredible truth uh, that we continue to lean into and learn from, and yet it's also that fundamental basic truth. So that's probably why he uses this language. Uh, verse 13, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. As in, you can't really claim ignorance. You know, you've, you've kind of given into the vastness of starting to know God and uh, lean into his ways and know his character and all those things. So you really can't claim ignorance at this point because you've started to become relationally connected to God more deeply. So essentially what he's saying is uh, continue to give into maturity and act like you know him as well. All right. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Now, I really think in a lot of ways he's talking about like the phases of our spiritual journey. You know, that you um, you understand that your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, right? And so God starts to really work in your life. And then, of course, what does the enemy do? The enemy doesn't like that very much. And so he counterattacks. You know, he just wants to he just wants to get in there, or not counterattacks, just attacks, right? And so you've come to faith, you have all these temptations and things. And so what he's saying is he's reminding you that that especially early on in your faith, you, you've, you've absorbed attacks from the evil one through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And so let that confidence continue on in you because inevitably the enemy is going to continue to attack and you want to make sure that you're prepared. And one of the ways that you prepare is by remembrance of how God has seen you through in prior attacks. All right, verse 14. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. All right, so perhaps this is another attempt to correct the Gnostic beliefs. To instead say that the gospel is for everyone, not just for the old, wise, like knowledgeable men, but for all. Because remember, the Gnostic belief is about what you know, right? So the older you get, you know, usually and hopefully the more you know. And so there could be a temptation to uh, just simply think that the faith was for the older, wiser men. And so what John is doing here is he's saying, no, uh, this is for everybody, every phase of life, however much you know about him, continue to lean in, but it's for the kids, it's for the young men, it's for the old men, it's for everybody. And remember when Jesus says, uh, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, which by the way, look that up because what he says after that, for those who hinder uh, the kids from coming to him, uh, it doesn't bode well for that group of people. What he's saying is this is for everybody, man. Uh, Galatians 3 is another great resource that um, everybody has access to him, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. All right, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, so now this can be a little bit confusing to us because he says, do not love the world, and yet John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. And so we have to understand what he's talking about. There's two different things uh, when you hear the world. All right, number one is the world as in humanity, the world, which we are to love. We are to love people. We are to uh, love even our enemies, which, by the way, separates Christianity from every other religion because there's no other religion or way of life that says love your enemies. All right, so we love the world, all right, in, in terms of humanity, but we don't love the world in terms of things like the world's desires or the ways of the world. And John here is speaking into the latter. He's talking about uh, in terms of the really just the seen and unseen realities that we've been talking about in our Unseen Kingdom series. He's talking about do we love God? Do we operate our lives from the unseen? Or are we focused on the seen realms, the temporary, the, the world, the, um, these, these three things that we're going to get into here in just a second that he talks about? But he says the world and its desires, all those things, the seen realities, all those things are passing away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. It's, are, we, are we motivated? Are we treasuring the temporary realities or the eternal realities? Now, we spoke on these three things at length on a Wednesday a few weeks ago. So just refer back to that video if you want to go back on our a YouTube page. I can't remember exactly what the title of that was, but it was uh, Wednesday night. And we talked about essentially the, the three things that John talks about here. The lust of the flesh, the first one, which is being run by our impulses, our desire. Uh, check out Galatians 5 or Colossians 3, that it really shows the difference between uh, the, the natural impulses, the ways of the world, versus living life in the spirit the spirit and what that produces as well. All right, so check out Galatians 5, Colossians 3 on that. Uh, lust of the eyes. If you go to Judges chapter 16, you see the, the story of Samson. Um, and man, he just like, just longs after Delilah, right? Just just is so attracted to her um, that he gives into temptation there. Uh, it's not just a, um, a sexual uh, attraction, it could be an attraction in terms of a, uh, a job or 
an achievement or something like that, that you're just so drawn to that it kind of takes control of you. Um, and then you have the, the pride of life. We're talking about uh, ego. Pride rules everything. It's why it's why Saul was so ruined, right? I mean, Saul is doing doing good things, you know, and stuff. And then uh, and then David comes along and he gets jealous of David and just kind of ruins everything. Why? Because he wanted that top position. Uh, same thing with Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter three. You know, the idea of of wanting to rule the world and things. Pride can ruin us. And then, of course, uh, we talked about a few weeks ago, Genesis chapter 3. You see all of these things encompassed. It says, when she saw the tree was good for food, which is the uh, lust of the flesh, uh, pleasing to the eye, which is lust of the eyes, and would make her wise, which is the pride of life, she ate it. So the enemy consistently will use these three things to try and make us love the world. All right, verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one denies the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledged the Son has the Father also. All right, so I don't want to get too deep into this because this is some uh, secondary theological landmines, uh, but I do want to highlight John's own words, which is that there are little antichrists, which simply means those who deny Jesus, that person is simply the antichrist. It's not some, uh, when you're talking about antichrists, plural, it's not some overly spiritual dynamic when he talks about that. It's simply those who claim to believe in the Father, but do not believe in the Son. John is trying to be very clear here that there are some who claim to be among us, but actually are not. It is not those that fell off. It's those who were never Christians in the first place. They're deceivers. They, uh, they're either intentional deceivers that come among us, um, or they're simply deceived. And that's what he means by the Antichrist here. They're deceived to not know uh, or believe or lean into the reality that Jesus is the Son of God. All right. Now, how do you know that you're deceived? <laughs> well, that's a whole other video. Uh, we could do that sometime. Or if you want to have that private conversation, that there's a lot there in terms of how you know uh, that you're deceived. But uh, if you're interested... By the way, uh, this second section is kind of it's kind of nerdy, but when you talk about the Antichrist, uh, there are some references that you can look at for that. Uh, Revelation 13 is one. Uh, Daniel chapter seven. Uh, they're essentially describing uh, that there will be a beast of some kind or an Antichrist of some kind uh, who will be deceptive and will be trying to distract us from loving. God, and uh, I don't want to get too far into that in this video because there's a lot more for us to go, but we can have that conversation some some other time as well. Uh, if you want to have that conversation privately, or maybe you're just rooting for there to be a video specifically about the Antichrist, we can maybe look at doing that as well. All right, uh, verse 24. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. As in, don't get distracted by those who are trying to deceive you. Just continue the course. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, 
just as it has taught you, remain in him. He's saying, you know the truth. You have God's spirit in you. So don't start being distracted by all these new false teachings. I mean, how often do you see that today? There's these just these new teachings that come about, right? Even though the Bible is 2,000 years old. And, and don't get me wrong, interpretation can vary at times. All right, I want to be clear about that. Interpretation of the scriptures. But there's like these new invented teachings. And you see in high school and colleges, I, Francis Chan said it so well. He was like, don't trade 5,000 years of truth for something your friend just came up with. These new false teachings. And so what he's saying here is not that not that you shouldn't listen to teaching generally, but you, you shouldn't listen to teaching that is not of Jesus. That's not in the scriptures, right? And so that's got to be the focus there. Uh, he's saying essentially just remain in him. Just like in John 15, Jesus says it himself, just remain in him. Remain close to the vine. Stay close to him. Don't go to these other teachings. Don't, don't fall into deception from these other teachings. Just stay close to him. Absorb teaching that's from him and about him, yes, and scripturally rooted, but don't go to these other areas. All right, verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. All right, so that's the end of the chapter, but uh, verse 28, let's go back to there real quick. Uh, when Jesus comes back, we want to be confident that he will find us abiding in him. I mean, wouldn't it be great for him to, to come back and it's like uh, it's like he's already here, you know what I mean? Because we've been walking with him and, and everything, and then it's just kind of like, oh, there you are. <laughs> and uh, it reminded me of, you know, when you're talking to somebody on the phone, and you're just kind of walking around and then all of a sudden you're in the same room together and you're just like, oh, hey, there you are. I mean, wouldn't that be a great picture of what it looks like when Jesus comes back? You know, that we are living on mission, that we're serving the poor, that we're loving our families well, that we're working hard at our jobs, that we are talking with him, that we're engaged with him and all those things, right? And then all of a sudden he just kind of appears and we're just like, oh, hey, it's good to see you. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you've come back in the flesh. Um, in contrast, when you haven't been walking with somebody and uh, really connecting yourself to somebody, and all of a sudden they come up behind you, you're startled, right? Maybe even embarrassed because you know you're doing something that is not of that person or that that person doesn't desire, right? That's his point here. Man, stay the course, remain in him. Church, as we conclude this chapter, remain in him, stay close to him. Let your life center around Jesus completely and nothing else. Just stay close to him. And perhaps when he comes back, we'll just say, we'll hang up the phone and we'll go, oh, hey, you're here in the flesh. It's good to see you. Come on in. That's our goal as Christians. Continue to stay the course, remain in him. Thank you guys for uh, watching this video. We get into love and what love is in the next chapter uh, and chapters to come. So looking forward to that. Thank you guys for taking the time to watch this video. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Love you, fam.